Hello! After a tip on a Facebook group, I bought three rubidium frequency normals. Two as spare parts marked on eBay and the other one as working. And today I want to show you what's inside a rubidium frequency normal. So over here we have one of the three. This is a unit which I bought as or in working condition. Um, all the three of them are from the brand Acubeat. And uh, yeah, so AR68 is the type model and uh, they have a sine wave output of 10 megahertz through so this is a make contact and for everything else they have a d type a sub d 9 connector here power supply is 15 volts dc and they have an open collector indicator for frequency lock on pin 3 which switches to ground when the internal quartz os oscillator is in sync with the rubidium frequency normal. So what's inside? Um, I will not open this one for now. This is the inside of one of these units. So the brains of the unit is an 6811 microcontroller over here and uh, the circuit board well it's, it's quite densely populated it's populated on both sides you will see this in a second and underneath there are these two metal cans this one is an oven controlled quartz oscillator with sine wave output and 10 megahertz and uh, this is the physics package and uh, so, as I said, I have two of these units which were marked as um, broken for spare parts only. And uh, one of them was uh, marked in the eBay listing as missing SMA connector. This is this one here, this circuit board where the SMA connector is broken off. And uh, so then the other one, it said that the lock would never happen. So there's some problem in syncing the quartz oscillator with the physics package. I swapped around the parts a bit so the serial number was 40 for four, no, 400 and 401 for um, the two other units. So this is the OXO from the unit 40, um, the mainboard from the unit 40 and the physics package from unit 41. Here we have the quartz oven of the unit 41 or 401, um, the circuit board and the physics package. And from all what I can see now, uh, I have out of these six parts, five working parts, which I can swap. I can swap the circuit board between these two circuit boards and together with the both of the ovens, quartz ovens, and this physics package, everything works. But neither of the units works together with this physics package. And it's called the physics package because inside here is the rubidium. And uh, let's see what's inside. I want to open it. Actually, I planned to open it from the start. Uh, I bought these three units just in order to have one to open and look inside and also to show my students what's inside a rubidium atomic clock. So everything is mounted on this steel base plate which also works as a heat sink. I find it a bit weird that the quartz oven is mounted on a heat sink. I mean, the idea is to keep the quartz crystal at an elevated temperature. So why would you mount a package on a heatsink? But um, that is what they did. And so this is still perhaps not much closer into the physics package. Um, some labels here. I, I don't know. Quality control labels. I don't know. Um, 
paper glued on top, one RF connector, and as what I could see from the circuit board and some testing, it is a around 90 megahertz frequency or phase locked signal which comes from the board which goes into this package and this uh, 12 pin connector is for all the other signals needed. So let's see if we can open this a bit further. It, it feels as it, if it should come out. I don't want to break it more than necessary and I also happen to know that there is a glass ampule inside with the rubidium vapor. Okay, we're in one step further. Um, shielding box over here, another layer, two, two more layers of paper. Store them here for a while. And uh, well, let's see. Well, I cannot see too much right now. It says trim and heater for some reason. Um, oh, okay. It comes out like this, out of the inner box. And luckily I have the video later to actually assemble it together again. Um, so, one more box. Th this, this feels like mu metal. Also, this felt a bit. Let's try with the magnet. Uh, here's a magnet. Yeah, the, all three of them are magnetic, so there is some magnetic shielding on the inside. And more paper. A hmm. lot of wires going everywhere. This looks like a Helmholtz coil. Which is wrapped around here. What I read about the workings of the rubidium clock, so it is a 6.7, I think, gigahertz transition between two energy levels in the rubidium atoms. And uh, in order to get there, actually, the rubidium vapor needs to be pumped by a infrared laser diet. So there should be some infrared laser diet somewhere in here. And then some oscillator. So actually, this part here um, looks to me like a microwave transistor, which is mounted on this block inside here. And uh, yeah, I actually don't know if I can disassemble it further without destroying it. Could do it be Clive now, or I can actually just keep it running and see. See what happens. There's a ton of wires going everywhere. Small wires, big wires, thick wires, thin wires. I would assume that these are heaters. There's comparatively thick wires going there. And uh, they are sitting on the outside of this block here. So the rubidium vapor has also... The, uh, rubidium is a solid metal at room temperature and uh, it needs to be evaporated for the operation and uh, it could be that this is happening there well don't see any glass ampule i can see through here and there's a gap between this block and this block here, but uh, uh, hmm. these are distance pieces. Here's some tuning screws, I assume. Let's try to get rid of this paper piece 
hier. Okay. Oh, I see a glass on you. I see glass. I see glass inside here. Um, I possibly also see glass inside here. Are there two of these ampules? How destructive do I want to be? So the yellow tape, this Kapton tape here is wrapping around the coil, but there seems to be another layer of Kapton tape keeping the coil in place. I mean, I, I when, when I bought the broken units, I was actually planning to and hoping uh, to take one apart to actually see what's inside. And I hope that, oh, yeah, there are the wires, they are taped, they are the, the thin wires attached to the tape. I don't like that. Um, hmm. Okay, what, what we can see is that the coaxial cable, it goes to this block over here, uh, which is then underneath the Helmholtz coil, or partly underneath the Helmholtz coil. Um, there's a circuit board, there's some um, SMD components, nothing magic I would see or think. I don't want to rip off any cables when ripping off the tape here. I'll do it carefully, hopefully. There's a loop of there's a loop of cable stuck inside the Kapton tape here, um, which otherwise only holds the block, or the Helmholtz coil itself on the block. Yeah, if, if it wasn't for the cables, for the wires, I could actually slide off the Helmholtz coil now Hmm. It says unit 261, I would say. Or is it unit 192? I don't know. Um, yeah. There is another, if, if these are heaters, possibly there's a one on these, so possibly it's one ohm resistors, um, then I would think that we have another heater here. What do we have here? This looks to be... First I thought it was a screw, then I thought it was a, a tunable capacitor. But uh, I don't know, it might be just an end cap which is soldered onto the package on this side. Okay, I have identified this transistor here, which is an MRF321 made by Motorola. Um, Motorola doesn't make any transistors anymore. Um, so here is a data sheet for this device by a company called Macom. And it is an RF NPN silicon power transistor. 10 watts, 400, 400 megahertz, 28 volts, um, which is a bit interesting because I know that the excitation of the rubidium has to be at 6.7 gigahertz. Um, on the other hand, I also know that the RF link between the boards is at 90 megahertz. It seems to be at 90 megahertz. So I'm not completely, I'm, I'm not absolutely not sure what happens here and how it's, or what the company's secret is. 
Um, so the case is shown here and uh, well here's a typical application test circuit um, okay well and here we have a view where we have um, two of the four flags which are actually emitter connections we have one base and one collector connection so in principle should be able to check whether this transistor is working or not. After all, transistors are one likely cause of failure in electronics. Um, so if we go back to the view here, then I can see that there's one connection to this flap and nothing to the other flap. From the picture I saw that the two opposing flags um, or connectors were emitters, so this should be one of the emitters. Oh, oh, this one of the emitter contacts, and this is the other emitter contact, which is not contacted at all. And then one should, one of the others should be base, and and one other should be the collector. Um, so I, essentially, I should be able to see a. A normal PN diet between, uh, yeah, between the emitter and the base and the collector and the base. Let's see if we have diets here. And since it's uh, supposed to be an NPN transistor, the emitter would be negative and the base would be positive. Um, ah, there's something with. 1.6 volts here. Um, here we have it. Here we have a diet between these two. So I assume then that this is the base, and then this one should be the collector. And so the transistor appears to be, yeah, it appears to be at least two diets. Doesn't tell me too much whether it's really working, but it tells me that it's not completely broken. Okay, it seems that I'm able to separate the two layers of Captain tape here, which have captured the connection wires, the relatively long connection wires to the Helmholtz coil. Um, and here I could remove it. And now the wires should be long enough to actually slide the Helmholtz coil of the rest of the package without breaking these wires and this this is long enough and this wire is long enough uh, something something is holding back and uh, the inside of the Helmholtz coil is also marked 261 so everything here and and the inside of the package is marked 261 so everything here is marked and labeled as belonging together I also measured and identified these heater resistors here. These are 10 ohm resistors. Here we have four of them in series. And here we have another pair of two of them in series. And on the other side, we have another two of these heaters. So these are, yeah, heaters in order to heat the inside of both of these metals, metal blocks. Now we can clearly see that there's a gap between these two metal blocks. Uh, we have some wires going into something which is mounted here on this block. Um, there is a couple of screws, which I previously thought were tuning screws. Um, this whole circuit board here seems to be more a mechanical um, insulator or an electrical insulator of the package with some standoffs. So There's nothing electronic on it, and I have no idea if these are actually tuning screws. Um, I looked a bit closer from the side, and these are no tuning screws. They are actually countersunk into a one millimeter or 0.8 millimeter 
thin circuit board. So they are just keeping this part mechanical in place. Let's see if we get further when we take off this circuit board. Gets loose here already. As I said, I, I thought that these might be tuning some cavity but that's obviously not what their job is. So we have these two metal blocks. Um, in each of the two blocks there seems to be a glass ampule or some kind of glass container and uh, well, both of these blocks are also connected with a lot of wires to everything else. Um, but I mean, what the heck, uh, let's, let's have a look. Oh, that's interesting. There, there's also four screws keeping these two halves together. So there seems to be some split in here, but let's, unscrew these two the same type of screw yeah could be um, I don't know if I have any hope of either <laughs> fixing this or or putting it back together or just keeping it apart I, I don't know yet yeah of course um, <laughs> The wires on all edges are too short to actually move this around even the slightest. Um, hmm. Which are the most limiting wires? These are not so limiting. These very th there are some very thin wires going around this edge here, um, which I don't know what they're going to. They're going into a component with two legs on, on this corner here. As I said, this could be a temperature sensor. Um, yeah, just wiggling it a bit, I actually got a little bit more distance and um, the heater wires down here are actually very limiting on the other hand they are possibly also the the easiest to replace but then we have also these here and they go to something with oh PD these two wires are labeled photodiode PD so this is this here underneath is obviously the detector which then detects the change in intensity of the light from the rubidium or passing through the rubidium. Oh, I'm so close to see something. And you are here with me. So here is a glass. Does it show? I don't know. There's a glass ampule. And in the other part, that's also, there's a round glassy object in here as well. Seem not to have ripped off any cable yet. I also looked at all the devices and components which I can see here. None of it seems to be bad or broken that one could see that. So this part of the physics package is soldered with a wire here to the baseboard and 
but uh, other than that there's one screw keeping it in place I don't know Can, do we get some freedom of movement if we remove this screw no it don't because it also seems to be glued in place that's too bad that's too bad okay well and now we might be into discovering one more interesting thing here um, I unscrewed these screws on this side here which I said were keeping something in place and the interesting thing is that the coax cable is not connected to anything else than this block here uh, so now we see that uh, the the only RF connection from the control board to the physics package is actually going to this circuit board here and there's no electrical connection leaving this in any other way um, if we look at the circuit board itself it is this RF connector here um, which is then close proximity to these coils here over here is the place for the 10 megahertz uh, oven controlled oscillator and there is some circuitry over here which according to all literature I can find about it is actually a frequency locked loop not a phase locked loop I actually must admit that I don't know the exact differences but it is used to multiply up the frequency and I could see on my oscilloscope a 90 megahertz signal going here um, th there's no way that there could be uh, a 6 gigahertz signal as is needed for the rubidium um, measurement itself on generated on this circuit board it there, there's not there's no um, gigahertz devices here um, so it, it's probably just this 90 megahertz signal which then goes on to here and um, this this block here looks like a ceramic block which you also find on and here this is definitely a tuning screw um, this one here so these ceramic blocks you also find as GPS antennas for example um, so it is definitely here where the magic happens we have a diet here um, which could be generating harmonics I don't know but uh, it, I find this tuning screw here quite interesting and perhaps that's where the magic is happening um, in multiplying the frequency but even better now is that we can have a look inside and here we see the glass ampules quite clearly um, it appears to be two separate ones I have to look closer myself here um, which are glued in place and sitting in this cavity over here and uh, then there must be an optical pass in this direction here because the actual measurement happens in the form of an optical measurement of the absorption of infrared light inside the rubidium vapor which is actually then feedback uh, through or the, the absorption is governed by the exciting state of the rubidium atoms which in turn react to the microwave field um, which is coming from here so this is a physics package inside a rubidium frequency normal if we look down here we can actually see a 
quite large five by five millimeters uh, at least no i have this is 10 millimeters this is even more this is six by six or seven by seven millimeter large uh, chip which is most probably just a silicon photodiode which would be sensitive enough for uh, the measurement of the absorption of the light so actually the light must be coming from this other side here um, and also this transistor which we have here is actually and i saw this only now it is connected emitter and collector here to the heating resistors so this high frequency um, 10 watt 400 megahertz transistor here is actually controlling the current through the heater resistors and by itself it is mounted on this other half of the package which also has heaters on this side but at the same time also the heat dissipation of this transistor is heating up this uh, part of the package which reminds me of an old uh, circuit idea which I know I have seen in a German electronics journal in the 1980s which was actually to build an oven controlled quartz oscillator by mounting a power transistor onto a standard quartz crystal and then using the dissipation the heat dissipation in the power transistor to keep the temperature of the quartz crystal constant while at the same time using the transistor as well as the temperature sensor quite interesting i've been looking for this article um, all the time now but i since i don't know which journal or which year it was i've not been successful to find it I found this article um, by some of the people uh, from the Ecobeat company uh, from which actually this uh, reference is and uh, the paper itself is on a Estonian server. I have no idea about the date of the publication or at, wh at what reason or for, for what um, conference perhaps it was published um, I could do some more research but I don't think it's necessary um, so it describes the state of the art of uh, frequency standards among other things the rubidium frequency standard the resolution of these pictures is not too great actually it's, it's you cannot see anything on them but um, this is described at other places. It also says here the resonance frequency is 6.834682 gigahertz and uh, that the cell itself contains rubidium vapor at 10 to the minus 6 tor in an inert buffer gas of about 10 tor pressure and uh, yeah, then it describes how it is that it's excited by actually a rubidium lamp. So uh, there, are, there is an, a rubidium lamp normally used emitting at 795 nanometers. And this is then passed through the volume of gas. Um, so that would explain why there are gas or glass ampules on both sides. Um, then we have here uh, the state of art oscillators and here actually they mention explicitly the Acubeat, the very small digital rubidium frequency standard Acubeat model AR40A and AR60A and the AR60A is exactly the one which we have here and which we have looked into. And uh, so on the picture up here, they show the smaller AR40A, um, but the pinout seems to be identical and we have the RF output here in the front. What's interesting is the block diagram, which they show here 
which shows the oven controlled oscillator which we have here it's uh, outputting the 10 megahertz in the front but the same 10 megahertz is used in a frequency multiplier to give us the 6.8 gigahertz for the physics package and all of this is controlled by a microprocessor in our case it's uh, the 68 s711 um, and uh, so it measures through, from a preamp the feedback from the photodiode inside and through a DAC it control gives a control voltage to the oven controlled crystal oscillator to fine-tune the 10 megahertz frequency and keep everything stable so to summarize, we can have a look again at what, what we have seen in reality here and how this compares. So this here is the main circuit board, which has the microprocessor here and the uh, digital synthesis is then at least partly done on, on this side here. This is where the oven controlled crystal oscillator normally sits like this and uh, then we have the RF connector here which passes the signal to the physics package the RF signal again it cannot be a 6.8 gigahertz signal coming from here uh, there is no no 6.8 gigahertz capable devices around here uh, which could directly um, generate or, or amplify or transmit even this high frequency and a fr4 circuit board like this wouldn't be suitable for this either um, so then we have the physics package here and in the physics package then we have on this side here the rubidium lamp uh, emitting the infrared light which then passes through um, the physics package here and at the end of the cavity over here we have a silicon photodiode which measures the intensity of the transmitted light which is influenced by the absorption inside the um, volume of gas here and this is then affected by the RF signal which comes and is coupled into the system through this let's call it an antenna block which actually provides the RF signal into the cavity here uh, we, we have this Helmholtz coil around here which is most probably necessary to shield off the um, earth magnetic field around it and uh, then we have wires going here so these wires which are marked PD come from the photodiode and then we have a couple of more thin wires which are connected over there probably to temperature sensors mounted on the package and we have the heater resistors here and here to warm up the package uh, to actually keep the rubidium in vapor phase and uh, we also have heaters here the same type of 10 ohm SMD resistors which are heater resistors it's connected to the phys to, to the main board through this 12 pin connector and sits like this in several layers of metal shielding as well um, to keep it yeah from the influence of the ambient so that was it for today and uh, for taking a part and looking into the physics package of a rubidium frequency standard